Welcome back to our ongoing series of videos on arches. In this particular lecture, we're going to focus on lateral stabilization of an arch. And that has to do with what keeps the arch from flopping from side to side. So here's an example of one of the most straightforward primitive things that we can do to make the arch laterally stable. In this case, the cross section of the arch has been made much wider in this direction. And implicit in this is somewhere down below where this arch attaches, uh, there's a good moment connection so that the bending action of this arch at the base can help stabilize the top of the arch through the beam action of this element. This is the same principle. Um, a little more elegant, two round tubes that are knit together with a web in between, but it's exactly the same principle. I like showing this slide because one of our challenges in architectural applications of arches is that when they come down to where the point where they're accessible in any way to people, uh, it becomes an attractive nuisance for anyone who wants to climb up over the top of the arch. So you'll notice this is a fairly decorative element, but often uh, after the fact, when people realize this is a problem, they implement some kind of design solution here, which is not so attractive. And even this one, when you think about it, it's really easy for somebody with the, the nerve and the athleticism to sort of crawl over this fence. But it is an issue that one needs to be concerned about in arch structures. And it seriously limits the number of applications that we're able to make in architectural situations. Um, in this case, this is the St. Louis Arch. We're looking straight onto it, but what we're really worried about is motion in and out of the page. So I'm mainly showing this image to give you a good sense of the proportions of it. But when we look off from the side, the tendency of the arch to move horizontally at the top in this direction is resisted by the thickness of the arch at the base. So this arch is more like a high-rise building than it is like an arch. And uh, under wind load uh, in this direction or a seismic disturbance in that direction, this bending capacity as it comes out of the ground is absolutely crucial. So it looks exactly like we would expect a cantilevered beam to look when we look at it edge on from the side. Now, this is not necessarily that pertinent to the topic we're talking about now, but I'm going to make a point, which is this arch is also larger in this direction. And so it looks a lot like a cantilever here, a curved cantilever coming out of the ground. And that turns out to be really crucial for two reasons. Uh, one is, architecturally, we have this function that we have elevators that go up. There are special elevators that remain, uh, the floors remain horizontal, even though they're tracking this curve, and we need to be able to get people into the building at the base, so that's crucial. But also, this breadth in this direction has to do with the um, structural function of the arch during the process of construction. So I have a sequence of images here which show the arch going up, and by the way, uh, you'll notice they've built a rail on the outside with this construction equipment going up those rails. And right at this point, we are, they are actually cantilevered out of the ground all the way up to this point right here. At some point, the tendency of those things to fall in towards each other becomes too extreme, and they are separated by this uh, truss work strut that holds them apart. And the construction continues on up. This shows you the shape of that cross section and the scale with these human beings up there that give you a sense of how large it is. It's not huge up near the top. It gets smaller and smaller, but it's still ample for human beings. And this is that trussed strut, which is a temporary feature to hold it apart. And here is the arch when they're about to insert the last member. And that member was so tight that they actually poured water. After the bridge had a chance to warm up, they poured 
cool water down the surface of the outside of both sides of the arch, which caused the arch to contract and pull apart at this last little sliver of space there in order to allow them to insert the last member. This just shows one of the cranes during the construction process. That shows the last member going into place. And it's quite a spectacular uh, achievement from a structural point of view, but also an aesthetic point of view. So a similar example is this tall arch to support this rail railroad. Um, basically, it has to stabilize itself laterally by having extra thickness at the base. So basically, this structure relative to wind loads perpendicular to the train and perpendicular to the arches, um, the mode of stabilization is for this to cantilever out of the ground. Um, this is somewhat the same. We have these very wide uh, uh, towers here which narrow down somewhat, but are still incredibly thick and sturdy. And then they attach to the arch, and the arch is a circular tube, which makes it good for resisting lateral uh, forces uh, and a tendency to buckle laterally, um, because it has good thickness in the direction perpendicular to the member. Um, but also uh, being a good torsional member is an advantage also. And the depth of this actually will help prevent roll through buckling also, which we're going to be talking about in the next section. Um, so you'll notice this thing is sort of splayed apart to give it a good uh, strong base. Uh, here's another example of that, where as we get more down towards the base, we don't really need all that width to handle the compressive forces, but we need that to handle the tendency for the thing to get blown over against wind forces in this direction or seismic effects. So at some point the arch splits into these two legs that give, her, give it a broader base and a more stable base. Now we can also take two slender arches which would have a very powerful tendency on their own to um, buckle from side to side and we can lace them together with these moment frames. And in this case, the nature of the moment frames has been accentuated by thickening this joint here to make sure that we get a really good connection. So what we have here is a rigid frame that we've talked about this kind of structure before, uh, where there's moment connections between all these uh, members crossing over and the arch members. Now, we can also truss those. In other words, uh, even better than rigid frame is to truss. One thing to keep in mind, though, is we still have some sort of rigid frame effect at this last opening in order to allow access. And so this becomes the key point where the thickness of this element, not only is that where the greatest compressive force exists, but it's where you're going to have the worst bending moment associated with wind force on this whole arch. So these members, even though they haven't gotten fatter to sort of accentuate that, um, probably have much thicker plates and are much stronger down at that base point in order to compensate for the fact that the rigid frame structure is not as efficient structurally as the triangulation. This is a little hard to see, but this is an example of a trust uh, trop cord where we every one of these square bays has a diagonal going that way, which you can just barely see, and a diagonal going that way. So every one of these bays is fully cross braced to provide this lateral stabilization. And you'll notice also at this point, any tendency to move back and forth in this direction is being resisted by these members that are thick in that direction to give good bending strength. And then they're moment connected back into all of this intense structure down below there. This one is a little bit easier to read. You'll notice the K braces, so named because this member plus that member form a K. Um, a K brace, by the way, as we talked about it in trusses, has the advantage that 
instead of taking a diagonal all the way across here and leaving this member really long and slender, uh, the K-brace comes in and braces that member at the halfway point, which produces a more structural, structurally uh, efficient form. Here's another example. We have K-bracing on both the top and bottom of this particular arch. You'll recall that we we haven't talked about this yet, but we will talk about the beam-like action in this direction, which is going to help with the vertical stabilization. Here we have some more uh, K trusses along the bottom of this arch. And I want to mention, by the way, this will come up in the next lecture, but this arch is deeper at the ends in the vertical direction because it's moment connected there to allow it to cantilever over this body of water and make it unnecessary for us to have any kind of centering which would support the arch down below. So in other words, this bridge is going to get constructed like the St. Louis arch where basically it's constructed from the ground up and it cantilevers from the foundation. Okay, so here is um, architecturally speaking, a classic way of stabilizing an arch. If you have a roof diaphragm that connects continuously to it, it will do a wonderful job of stabilizing the arches against lateral buckling. Again, the challenge becomes right down here where we've opened it up to get some light or possibly allow people to flow into the building there. Um, relative to lateral movement perpendicular to these arches. This becomes the weak point for the arches and they will have to be given enough lateral thickness that whatever bending moments are induced at that point they will be able to resist it. Here is another example of that theme. In this case we're looking at um, steel bow trusses which are fairly thin and not laterally very stable but on the top we have this corrugated decking which is welded down to it. This corrugated decking represents an incredibly solid diaphragm roof which is stabilizing the top cords of these bow trusses. This is the parabolic arches for the Broadgate Exchange House. Again I remind you that there are one of these arches on each face and then two in the interior of the building. Now, these are pretty thin arches, and their tendency to buckle laterally is fairly substantial. It's a serious concern. In this building, though, on the other faces of the building, here and here, there's lots of cross-bracing. And at every one of these joints, the arches connect back into the floor plate or the floor structure of the building. So the bracing on this end of the building and this end of the building keeps those floors from moving in and out uh, relative to this viewpoint that we have here or this image and that's what stabilizes these arches laterally. So anytime you conceptualize using an arch you need to think about what are all the mechanisms that are available to help us keep that arch from flopping from side to side and it's all the classic things. We can make it horizontally more beam-like. We can make it rigid frame-like. We can truss it and triangulate it. Um, we can change the shape of it so it's wider at the base and narrow at the top. But whatever we do, we have to account for that mode of failure, which is lateral buckling. That ends our, our uh, video on lateral stabilization of an arm.